Um, so for everyone who is on, uh, thank you for joining. Welcome. Um, my name is Daniel Warlow. I work for Campari America. I have the glorious uh, and wonderful position uh, covering all of our Italian brands. So our Italian brands um, range from a pair of TV to DJ's TV. We've got stuff that's, that spans uh, over 160 years of history. So a lot of, uh, a lot of heritage, a lot of quality in those brands. Um, they all have really unique individual stories and a lot of that has to do with the fact that they were all created at a different time in a different place by a different person and then eventually found their way into our home uh, where we, we look after them and love them and take care of them. So um, one of the brands that we have is called Amaro Braulio. Braulio is a very, very unique Amaro for, for a couple of reasons. One, uh, it is a, an alpine Amaro. So as you would imagine, it is from the Alps. So uh, right on the, the Swiss border uh, in Northern uh, Italy, it is in the Italian Alps. Uh, it is actually named after a mountain called Mount Braulio. Uh, and this mountain is right in the center of the Stelvio National Park. Um, the Stelvio National Park is the largest national park in all of Italy. Uh, there is something called the Stelvio Pass, which in the winter time is um, one of those like really snowy, windy roads going up the hills and everything. Um, so it is a, a really cool, really unique space. Uh, if, uh, if you ever get the chance to go there, if traveling happens anytime soon, uh, you definitely should do that. It is great in the summer. It is great in the winter. It is great all the time. Uh, Braulio was also unique because in the basement of the distillery, which has been there uh, the entire time, and we've been making Braulio there the entire time, uh, there are catacombs filled with barrels. And these barrels house Braulio while it ages for 18 months uh, in used um, Slovenian oak casks. Um, it is also really unique in its aroma and its flavor, very much an Alpine Amaro. Uh, one of the, the major attributes to that is uh, the introduction of juniper into the mix. So in most Amari, you're going to have bittering agents, you know, like gentian root or uh, rhubarbro, rhubarb root, carchofo, um, you know, artichoke leaves. Uh, this has wormwood. Uh, it has yarrow root. It has gentian and it has juniper. And those are really apparent on the nose and on the palate as well. Um, really, really beautiful Amaro. It doesn't get as much love as I wish it did. Um, we now have twice as much of it because uh, when we took over the brand in 2014, we had to make a decision. It was, do we take this amazing Amaro, which is still made by the Poloni family, uh, Eduardo and Francesco Poloni, still the great grandsons of Francesco Poloni who created it, still make it to this day. Do we take this Amaro? Do we move it to a warehouse where we can you know, obviously put up a rick house and put more barrels up and, and age more of it because obviously if you're if you're on the hillsides trying to build a rick house it just doesn't work or do we do the responsible thing and just buy more land and build more tunnels and double the agent facility which we did so um Braulio was still made in the same place since 1875 which i'm really really proud to represent this brand uh, there's a lot of heritage there i'm going to stop talking about that uh i'm going to introduce uh karina martinez thank you so much for joining and also thank you so much for putting this seminar together. I'm really excited because it is one of my favorite things um, that I think uh, every bartender, every person in hospitality should talk about. Um, we shouldn't be afraid to talk about these things. We shouldn't be afraid to ask questions about these things because it is so vital and so important, especially in our industry. So thank you so much for putting this together. Yeah, you're very welcome. Thank you for the platform and the support in doing it. Uh, my name's Karina. I'm here in Sacramento, California. I work at a bar called The Snug, which I am currently at. Um, you might hear a gentle hum of a juicer because there is still fresh juice pumping through here. Um, but yeah, I wanted to take the time today to talk about your mental health, your stress levels, and the best ways to kind of do that in such a trying time. Basically here to justify all of your wanderlust and why you just kind of want to run for the mountains. Um, so if we want to get going on this slide, Daniel, do you have anything else you want to add? Um, no, I think um, I think that was a good intro and I'm, I'm really excited to, to dive into this. Um, I really appreciate you letting me uh, share some of my experiences as well. So I hope it's beneficial for everybody. Yeah, um, so I think the one thing that unites us all is the hospitality industry. That's why we're all here. That's why we're on this platform. 
Uh, the slide that you're seeing is snug on New Year's Eve when we were still toasting 2020 and all of the positive things that we thought they were gonna be. Now it's just positivity in a much different way than we usually have it. Um, so I just wanted to talk about a little bar story. Um, I came in, was probably right before the new year. Um, it was a Saturday night. Uh, I was about to tag in. I usually get to work a little bit early. The music was bumping, people were piling in. It was one of those nights that you knew it was just gonna be full force and time to go. Um, and it was one of those shifts that you just really want it. Like you're ready to cue in, you're ready to have that flow where you just know you're gonna have a lot of concentration, a lot of support from your team and throw a giant party for all of these beautiful strangers walking in. But a couple walked in that didn't necessarily catch my attention other than they were a handsome couple, they were well-dressed. The gentleman pushed his way to the front of the bar ordered his first rounds and I kept going. I didn't really think much of it. I didn't really stop. If I would have had more time, maybe I would have judged them. Maybe I would have thought that they were, you know, particular or bougie or entitled. They were just very direct. Um, got their drinks, moved around the bar and came back and sat right in front of me when a couple chairs opened. The gentleman of the couple got out of his seat every single time a female came up to order drinks. Not once, not for 30 minutes, but for hours, he sat there. He sat there, gave up his chair, swiveled them around, pointed out a menu, pretty much doing my job for me, and did it in a way that made every single female feel comfortable. He didn't, you know, overstay his welcome in offering the gesture and just went back to the female counterpart and continued their conversation. The reason I share this story isn't because it was something immaculate that happened that most people would tell about, but because as a bartender, I constantly get asked, what's the craziest thing you've happened, that has happened behind the bar or that you've seen? And honestly, I can't answer that question. I think a lot of the things that the general populace seems as crazy or absurd or over the top has just become normalized to me. I've been behind the bar for 12 years and I feel like the bar is just simply a platform or an environment that a lot of people come uninvited. And sometimes it's acceptable, sometimes it's not. But the reason I share this story is because it has still stuck with me. And I feel that positive stories now linger longer to me than negative stories because they haven't been normalized. Because what good, what amazing hospitality that is seen on the other side is is really rare and I think that as COVID is is ongoing and lasting longer than maybe any of us thought and a lot of us are trying to find how to keep our bars open, how to stay safe, how to keep staff safe. Um, we're also hit with a lot of more negative or more in your face or more explicit opinions of our guests. Um, so even though 2020 has been trying and it hasn't looked like what we wanted to, I think there is still a lot of positivity that is coming from it. Um, and it just looks very, very different and maybe unearth a lot of things that we didn't try. But there is still a lot of positivity and good that we're seeing as well as the negative. Um, so with that said, the reason that a positive interaction with a guest isn't normalized is because our job is stressful. So the next slide, is what they don't tell you about the hospitality industry, right? We see a good time, we see flexible hours, we see a lot of perks, but a lot of the things that they don't tell you is that it is incredibly demanding, that it is long hours, that you will be harassed in some sort of way or the attempt to be manipulated in some sort of way. You know, society doesn't view us in the same way as other professions do, you're objectified, a lot of times you don't have health insurance and we do have the potential to make a lot of money, but there is still the factor of the unknown because it's not necessarily consistent. Um, this is kind of always there, but what has come with COVID and political and racial tensions are additional tolls um, given COVID and the, and the current political climate of things. 
So the next slide is the new stresses that have been added to this already pretty long list. You know, what is an essential worker? Are we deemed essential? Are we not? How does that fit into the views of ourself and our own self-esteem? You know, do you go back to work and possibly get sick? Financial insecurity, instability. Are you choosing between health? Um, are you facing increased remarks or opinions? People not wanting to follow mask rules? All of these things that have been added to it. So as a hospitality professional, we are constantly giving out a lot. We're giving out our time, our emotion, our physical energy. And a lot of that leaves us empty. There's not, a, not, not enough reserves for the rest of our lives. We're, we're trying to continually pull from a second, from a cup that is, is empty. So that is another reason on why I think at this point, I tend to really stick out positive stories from the other side of the bar. Um, I shared mine. I would love if all of you kind of took a time and took some inventory to think about what are some of the positive stories that have stuck with you? What are some people that have made an impact? What are some showings of love or affection or gratitude that you've seen from guests coming in? And Daniel, I was wondering if you had any stories that you wanted to share that really have stuck with you through the years. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, when you said that, it, it actually started to like just the reels of, of experiences started to go through my mind because, um, you know, I've been working in this industry. Um, I, I almost don't even want to say how long because it makes me it makes me feel really old. But I started <laughs> um, working in this industry when I was 15 years old. So um, uh, and I was kind of born into it. My my mother worked in a Chinese restaurant and um, while she was putting herself through college and putting me through school, um, she kind of brought me in, you know, most nights I would come after school, I would uh, go there and have dinner with her and, and everybody at the end of the shift. And and actually, when I turned 15, that was my first job was as a busser in that Chinese restaurant. Um, and, you know, from that, from the very beginning, it always felt like a family environment. You know what I mean? There's the hospitality industry is, is so interesting, because especially if you've been in it that long, or, or if you've committed yourself to the industry, which I think I kind of did at that moment and never looked back. Um, it, it's a it's a part of you instinctively, everything that you do in, in your life is is run by it. And I think a couple of those things that you put on the slide are really important to talk about. Um, because those are, those are the, the troubles, the things that we have to deal with. I mean, every industry has, has its own thing. But um, especially when it comes to um, you know, your, your mental health, your physical health, all of those things. And, and especially now everyone having to go back to work, like you shouldn't have to choose between your, your mental health, your physical health and your job and the money that comes in. Like the, the financial stresses are already kind of bad enough as it is, you know, and then you put this on top of it. So I just wanted to acknowledge that quickly before I get um, too deep into this, but um, one of my favorite stories, and actually it's, it's somewhat more recent, um, I was working behind the bar. Uh, this is probably about three or four years ago uh, when I was still bartending. And I was working behind the bar. And as you do most nights, obviously, you take a, an inventory of the people at the bar. Uh, you know, you check in on them every once in a while. You get everybody their drinks. You move around. You, you know, kind of make that cycle around the bar. And there was this gentleman who came in, um, seemed to be on a date with someone. So I went over was pretty, as cordial as I could be without being kind of in their face. And he was very engaging and very interactive. So I spent a little bit more time with him. And we just, you know, we just chatted about cocktails and about, um, you know, the, the experience. And he was like, you know, I, I live in New York, but this is a really, a really cool bar. And um, you know, a friend of mine suggested that we come here. Um, you know, why is it so fun and casual and comfortable? I was like, I mean, that's the whole purpose of this bar. Every Everybody that works in this bar has been in this industry a long time. And, and what we really want people to do is come here and feel comfortable no matter what. It, no matter, this is a space for everybody, you know, and it's a space for any sort of, you um, uh, celebration or whatever it may be. And he was like, man, that's really great. He's like, and I just want to say like, this has been one of the best experiences we've had. And turns out he was a bartender from New York, of course, you know, and we just had this really long conversation. Anyway, long story short, this unnamed gentleman who is just one of the most amazing humans on the planet is now a very good friend of mine. Uh, and he also works, uh, works at a bar in New York. And it's, it's those interactions that you have with people that can create what lifelong interactions, lifelong friendships, because when you're sitting there behind the bar, when you're engaging with people, 
yeah, you're really just putting yourself out there. You, everything that you're doing is you. And it's and it's in a, a manner of servitude that is really interesting because if you're really, really good at what you do, you, you would just put it all out there every single time you're behind the bar. Every single time, every interaction is the most important interaction. Everything that you're doing is to, to achieve this super high level of hospitality that some people in the industry can only like dream to achieve. And I've, I've experienced it from people being at a bar and just been like, you have literally done it. But what you don't realize is that sometimes this comes at a cost and it comes at a cost to you personally. And sometimes you don't notice it while you're in the moment because your adrenaline's flowing and you're really into it and you're really excited and your endorphins are through the roof. And then next time, you know, next thing you know, it's four in the morning and you're like, man, I'm just like exhausted. I'm scrubbing these wells and I got to get some sleep. So it was a long story, but you know, I think it, I think it speaks to most people's experiences. No, absolutely. And, and it really is about those connections. Um, whether they're in the hospitality industry or whether they're just going to be your new regular or your neighborhood patron. Um, I think a lot of us are in this industry because, or at least staying in here because of that human connection, whether it's with your coworkers, that it's that family environment or, you know, the stranger that's going to become your friend. But I think most of us, when we picture what it was like behind the bar pre COVID, it's a lot of chaos. You know, you look at you look at the slide and you see tons of people and there's beer taps and people are going and you don't really stop and think about all the little tiny positive things. You think about the chaos and the masses and that's kind of what sticks to us. And one of the reasons that that happens is because on that list of what that we saw previously on what the job actually entails is that bartending is a high psychological demand with minimal control. So other jobs have this as well, right? High psychologic demand, minimal control. Those actually increase your stress levels quite substantially. So our jobs overlap a lot with hospitality and legal. And this slide right here, yes, we might both be under stress. We look very different doing it, right? Where as medical or legal professionals maybe have a little bit of time to, to sit with their feelings and their thoughts or to act out and have it be justified is very different than a hospitality professional. It doesn't really matter what happens to us. It doesn't really matter what is said to us. The expectation by the expectations by the other people are that we are to maintain a friendly and hospitable manner regardless of what is going on. Obviously not all of us yeah. abide by that. Yeah. Obviously uh, some people are better at it than others, but the stresses are still there. So if we have similar stress, then how do we cope with this? What? what is the coping mechanisms between doctors and lawyers and bartenders? How are they same? How are they different? Right? We both have high demands. We both have high stress levels. We both have to function at high levels constantly for hours or days on end without necessarily breaks. And you look at our society and we're treated very differently. You know, there's a lot of prestige. There's a lot of benefits to being a doctor or a lawyer that we don't necessarily get. We are kind of the black sheep of society. You look at the hours we work, you look at what's expected of us, whether it's your family call and be like, why can't you come to Sunday brunch? You're like, well, I didn't go to bed till 6 a.m. That's why. Um, but in, as much as we wanna pat ourselves on the back of this, it's, it's also very different, right? As far as professionalism go, we don't have to take out huge financial debts to learn how to be a bartender. We don't have the liability issues that they do. Um, and we also don't get paid like they do. So there are similarities and there are some differences, but how we cope with this is, is the big issue that, that we're really here for. How do we cope? It's not good. There, without going to say, I think that the statistics just in your bars or your home markets alone can probably tell you that, um, you know, 70% of restaurant workers have admitted to using drugs. That's just admitting, you know, there's a huge, huge part of us that have addiction issues, that have social issues, that feel peer pressured, um, and the long-term effects of these. 
whether it's heart issues, whether it's depression. And I think that the positive side of this in our industry is that it has been a conversation more and more over the last couple of years is this mental and emotional stress where a lot of the times before we would just kind of sweep it under the rug, maybe make excuses, maybe even, you know, add, add to it with our coworkers. But with this increasing rate, we're also seeing people in our hospitality industry stay for longer. Whereas this might have been a phase for some, many are choosing this as a career path. And so there's not really any breaks in life to try and take a step away and take a time out and re-examine what your habits are or what your consumption is. The pandemic has kind of afforded us this small break to either feed in or take a step away from what our usual habits are. So taking a, taking a mental inventory of how much we were consuming before, what we've been consuming during pandemic and the stress, this is class is kind of your time out and a reminder to feed yourself and feed yourself well. We've already talked about all of the stresses that come with our job, all of the unknowns. You know, our society has a lot of measures that don't really apply to what fulfills us. And I think that Bobby Kennedy had a really good quote, which is the gross national product, product the GNP, which most countries are base, base their health on. Uh, it measures everything in short, except for, except for what makes life worthwhile, right? What actually fills up our cup? What actually leaves us feeling whole? What actually brings us back to the table rejuvenated and or better than before? And this is where we get into this class concept, which is whole hospitality. Um, we operate on the idea that we should be able-bodied or whole enough to warmly and empathetically make people feel at home. That guess that Daniel was talking about, why does it feel so good? What is, you know, what is going on? It really is that genuine giving of hospitality. It's the ability to provide hospitality that is fulfilling to you as it is to them. It feels good to make other people feel good. Again, another reason that we're in this for so much. So how do we ensure that we are showing up to give hospitality in a way that is genuine instead of just begrudgingly pushing through the shift, showing up because we have bills to pay? If we show up to the bar out of duty and responsibility instead of giving and caring, you give two very different styles of service. So this class, how do we become whole while staying in this in this field and not letting us drag it down is is what what we're here for so i also want to take this time to mention that i'm going to present some information that is statistics these are not my ideas these are not my research i am not a professional in psychology or any of the other realms i'm about to discuss i'm simply here just sharing information sharing resources and sharing stories of how it's positively impacted my life or the people around me. So what is really going on on our stress levels? It's your three pound machine that needs regular maintenance and care. Our three pound machines are our brains. So continuing to do a job that is high precision, high demand with minimal control is stressful, but why? Um, basically, Brains are easily fatigued. We're prone to mistakes while we're multitasking. We're distracted. But what's really happening in order to be proficient at our jobs is something that's called directed attention. Directed attention is ignoring distractions and voluntarily focusing your attention in efforts of prolonged concentration. Um, this adds to mental fatigue. This adds to stress. This also takes your effectiveness and tones it down. So as you're behind the bar, you are ignoring people that are yelling at you. You're ignoring the 5,000 questions while you're systematically working to provide the best service for the most people at a given time. Your brain gets tired. Stress is essentially a condition or experience uh, when basically the person perceives the demands or the demands exceed what a person is able to give. This is why teamwork and having a team of support is so essential and can make stress behind a bar at a minimum level. 
what's your day like when you have a super efficient bar back versus someone that you're still training? What is it like when, you know, your floor manager is sick and doesn't show up and you don't have that support? A lot of this, this attention and this focus and this stress is also more approachable with high functioning teams. So if our brains are a little foggy and a little slow because of directed attention, how do we relieve directed attention and how do we kind of reset our brains? We do that by participating in involuntary condition. This is a topic that uh, David Strayer talks about at length um, and he, he pretty much focuses his research on attention and what happens. So the antidote is involuntary condition and what does that mean? That basically means you don't have to take a pause and stop blocking everything out. You can take your blinders off and you don't have to focus so much on one task by having everything else cut out. You can just be, you absorb information better, um, especially if you're in peaceful stimulus, like natural environments, natural sounds, you don't have to have an act of will to avoid distraction. It allows the brain to disengage and restore its capacity. So this is kind of the timeout. This is also what happens to your brain when you're in natural environments, when you're in parks, when you're in gardens, when you're camping. This involuntary attention is what kicks in. Um, so why is this harder? It seems like a pretty simple solution. Why is this difficult? Um, I think a lot of times we view ourselves as an entity that doesn't belong in nature. Our quest for civilization often, often undermines our animalistic needs. Yes, we are mammals. Yes, we have a high functioning frontal cortex that allows us to do all these things and thumbs. But at the biological base of it, we are simply mammals. We're nothing but mammals. So creating these environments that are curated, that move us away from our biological base is an argument that's been made uh, mainly in a book called Sapiens that it adds to our stress. It doesn't allow us to reset. So how does that change? If you look at the examples of our food chain, fresh juices, fresh syrups, all of the things that we that we play with that makes kind of pinnacle bar programs as, as we've been told, most people are disconnected from their food chains. You look at the effort and the finances that go into elementary schools for community gardens and how plants grow. It's something that no longer is just apparent to us. We've removed ourselves so far from it that we've moved ourselves from, away from the biological base. Um, and a lot of the times we try to fix these stressors without with just the symptoms, you know, antidepressants are on a rise on how much they've been prescribed. Um, it was, I think it was 64% increase in the prescription of antidepressants from 94 to 99. That's only gone up since then. And I don't have current stats, but you can extrapolate that and think of what that is. So instead of going straight for antidepressants, finding out what is actually stressing us out in our in our field, directed attention, and how do we take it upon ourselves? Because most people don't have health insurance and most people that even do, there's not really coverage for mental health. So being out in nature, being able to smell and hear, it kind of allows our sensory receptors to receive information from the natural world and allow them to recalibrate to what they really are. Um, going back to the fact that we're nothing but mammals, it's it's, we're funny, right? The reason that long eyelashes and all these lash extensions in cosmetics is really a biological base. Long eyelashes are actually naturally a pinnacle of fertility. Red lips are, or the red lipstick is there too because when a female's naturally aroused, her cheeks flush and her lips flush, giving the apparent of rouge and lipstick. I mean, even, you know, the most opposite end of the spectrum of every barback's, you know, favorite task of cleaning, cleaning up vomit 
if you think of people that have a very negative reaction to seeing that and follow suit in those same actions, it actually goes back to biological base of in tribal mentality. If somebody was to vomit something, the rest of the tribe would have that same response, thinking that somebody ate something poisonous. So all of these things that we talk about and that we do and kind of do mindlessly really do have a biological base for it. Stress does as well. Um, so I want you to kind of close your eyes, take a minute and imagine that you're in a super picturesque forest. You can hear your feet crunching underneath pine needles and sticks. It's that warm golden glow. It's where you kind of feels like it even makes your skin sparkly. You can hear birds going and you feel a gentle breeze. In a forest, this is something that we take time to go ahead and savor and be mindful of and aware. These same sort of stimuli do affect us in the city, but we're so distracted by all of the noises and goings on that it is something that we often are lackluster about or something that we don't engage in at all. There's still, you know, that golden hour that comes in at the snug, the way that our windows are positioned, it hits it just right. And it's, it's a really beautiful time. But a lot of us just kind of rush around and don't notice the greenery or the foliage while we're in the cities. Um, but doing exercises like this can also help your stress, your stress hormones as well and kind of help recalibrate you. Um, so we've talked about this. Green spaces and ecotherapy. What actually is it? It's pretty simple. It's basically unplugging for 72 hours and no cell phones, no service, throw your phone in airplane mode, just leave it in the car, do whatever you else, is this effect that green spaces have on us as human beings that help us de-stress, recalibrate, reset, and come back better than before. I say 72 hours, that's the optimal time, but even an hour a day, having daily rituals, weekly rituals, whatever you can fit in, um, are, are pretty healthy doses, even with that. So. Why, why are we talking about this on this forum? Why is this necessary for our industry? The concept sounds pretty simple. Go play outside, go run in the mountains, go be free for 72 hours. It doesn't sound like a hard sell, but thinking about it, how often do people actually engage in this? How often do people leave their urban environments, leave their comforts and actually take the opportunity to do it? A lot of us live in urban environments. The major markets are in cities. A lot of the major markets, there's not a ton of parking. Traffic sucks. Not everywhere has great public transportation. It's where the jobs are. Usually you make more money. Sometimes the cost of living is higher. Um, but at what cost, right? Moving to major cities, moving to major markets do have their appeal and do have their draw. But at what cost? Are you still in an area where you can de-stress? Are you still in an area that you have access to the things that are good for you, that you take time to de-stress and engage in, whether it's a creative outlet, whether it's the wilderness, whether it's an education system, whether it's simply a beach? Um, there are trade-offs between the two. So what, what are some of the positive effects of this ecotherapy that, that I'm toting to y'all? Um, a lot of this is interacting with natural environments have been proven to decrease stress and increase mental health. It helps you retain information. It helps you foster connection. Think about the time that you've spent with individuals outside or on a hike versus the connections you've made with somebody sitting next to them in a seminar, right? You can send someone next to a seminar and just scribble notes down and maybe never talk to them other than hi or excuse me while I squeak by. Not talking to someone for a five hour hike really, really cement in y'all's relationship, right? Like if you don't have anything to talk about for five hours, maybe, maybe you know that that relationship's time to move on. Whereas maybe why did you even go on that hike? <laughs> right, exactly. It's like, right, maybe, maybe new friends. Whereas other people, maybe it's your coworkers, maybe it's a friend of a friend, but you go outside and you find all of these intersections and all of these common ground 
with this human that you never even knew was possible. Um, so your connections are definitely higher in the outdoors usually as well. Um, your sensory input also starts recalibrating and you stop this directed attention attitude of blocking things out. You're able to smell more smells. You're able to hear more minute sounds. You're, you're allowing more sensory info to come into you instead of continually blocking it out. It also increases your creative side and your productivity side, your problem solving. So if you are know that you and your staff are coming up to a new menu launch and you have to you have to take time to create some cocktails, workshop, R&D, whatever it is, and you're just at a dud, maybe take some time with a few of your coworkers and go on a hike, go in the river. Think about all of the things that are naturally around you in your environment, the smells of pine, the here in California, we have a ton of citrus, you see berries all along the path. You start thinking about what's around you, what's in your natural environment. You start getting inspired about the things that you wanna play with, but yet you can also smell better so your palate's better. Maybe taking a little nature break to really get your team up to par with those creative juices flowing. And then our stress rates. You look at countries like South Korea, Japan, and Singapore, they're really the one countries that are taking this whole ecotherapy and running with it. and the, the suicide rates in these countries were extremely high. And what they're finding, they're finding that ecotherapy is so useful that they are taking time and investing and dedicating land masses to these urban parks and these urban environments. And they are seeing a de decrease in suicide rates as well. They're also doing things like lowering the hours worked. There's a lot of things going into it, but green therapy is definitely one of the principles in this as well. Um, in the U.S., I usually see most of this going towards our medical field. Um, so whether you're in a hospital bed and there's nature pictures on the wall, whether you go to your doctor's office and there's some picture of a beautiful landscape with, you know, an inspirational quote on it. Um, I was listening to one of the newer episodes of Radio Lab this last week, and uh, they were actually talking about the 1918 Spanish flu. Um, and they made a statement that said they found research that one hospital was able to re reduce their death rate by two thirds just by wheeling beds outside for the day. Whether, whether that was causation, I don't know, but you do look at what's going on with our pandemic and we are, we are referencing the 1918 flu a lot in what we do, but we're talking about green spaces and open air, how it's less contagions, how it's safer, but also how that's helping the people that are already sick, whether it's physically or whether it's mentally and emotionally. So there is a decent amount of research out there already um, on that. But as we are taking this time to kind of re-examine what health is, where we're at, I think it's also a good time to kind of talk about happiness. Um, what are what are things of happiness? What are our pinnacles? How do we how do we actually achieve them? So, in the realm of positive psychology, there's this concept that there's there's three good lives, and three types of happiness. There's the pleasant life, the good life, and the meaningful life. The pleasant life is what I feel like Americans excel at. It's positive emotions. It's the immediate satisfaction, it's the Instagram likes, it's the new shoes, it's the car, it's that stimulus check that you should be putting back in to our economic system, shopping from local providers, supporting your favorite bartenders. It's, it's all of these things, it's sex, it's drugs, it's alcohol, but it's also gratitude, savoring, mindfulness, and appreciation. The pleasant life is also habitual. So whatever you are putting time into, whatever you are feeding is what is going to perpetuate, whether that's positive or negative. The interesting thing about the pleasant life or the positive emotions, it's one of the items that is hereditary for us. It's up to 50% hereditary on how many of these positive emotions can we really experience. So with that said, if it's kind of locked in, how does that help us? How does that help us increase it? 
Well, by using methods such as savoring or mindfulness, you can actually increase these positive emotions by 15 to 20%. So having the attention and having the discipline on these things, if it's something that you want to make a change, is something that, again, hereditary, you can increase, but it's also habitual. Uh, the good life, these are things that we talk about flow, right? These are things where time stops for you, whether it's you're having a bang and Friday, Saturday night shift, and it just feels like the time has stopped and you're in a good flow. This is also what we talk about when we when we speak about athletes being in the zone is the state of flow. This might happen when you're with your family, as a parent, with a partner, volunteering. These are places where you have such a concentration that is almost effortless and transcends time and space almost. And then there's the meaningful life. This requires the most effort. This is knowing your strengths, knowing how to use them and using them for the better, right? Using them for something good that is further outside of yourself, better for the community, volunteering. So these are three types of happiness that are all achieved by different avenues. And they all also affect us differently. So the pleasant life, the positive emotion side, really accounts for almost nothing as far as long-term. It feels good now, but it's something that dwindles quickly. So it's like you got a new jacket, you're stoked on it, you're excited, but then you hang that jacket up and that feeling or that sensation of happiness goes away. The good life, it accounts for a little bit more of your happiness. It stays with you, but it also kind of needs to be renewed. Just because you had those emotions and those moments, it leaves you kind of wanting more. It makes you want to go back for it. And the meaningful life is the the side of happiness that gives you the most fulfillment and lasts with you for the longest. Now these are interchangeable, they are disjointed. You can have all of them, you can have none of them, you can have two out of the three. These are all things or goals that you can work towards with different schools of thoughts, practices, and all of that. And there are many classes, there are many rabbit holes of YouTube that you can you can go down this rabbit hole and, and get more information on if you like. But I think it's good to take a pause and look at, there are different types of happiness. You can achieve them from different ways and you can even mix and match them. So hopefully that is a little bit more hopeful than just being 50% inherited by something else. Um, so how do we cultivate this? How do we cultivate, cultivate a meaningful life? Um, it's super cliche. It's one of those things that you have to find your own path. You have to find your own meaning. Um, when we've heard it a million times, and it's way easier said than it is done. Um, and the business behind the bar, behind our screens, we often forget to take time to soak in the outer world and explore what we're actually sitting with. And so cultivating a meaningful life is finding the things where you take inventory in feel like you could be better, feel like there's something you're missing, feels like there's a gap, feels like maybe you need to reach out and ask for help with something. Cultivating is not something, meaningful life is not something that's just going to appear. It's something that you're really going to have to work for. So in the context of this, cultivating a meaningful life, cultivating a life that de-stresses you, leaves you coming back to the bar better than before. And I'm telling you, I achieve that by going to play outside. So form follows function. How do you cultivate a meaningful life? How do you find these gaps? How do you ask for the help? I feel like a lot of times we get ahead of ourselves. We need to check certain boxes. Sometimes the best way is just to simply start. The best way to train for a backpacking trip is to simply start walking, whether you decide you need to go get groceries and you're gonna to walk to the grocery store or the corner mart or the bodega, whatever it is, instead of taking your bike, taking a lift or whatever. It's gonna take more time, it's gonna take more planning, it's gonna take more physical effort. You're gonna to have to carry those groceries or those beverages back with you. Um, so, it, so it makes you stop and think, it makes you be more mindful, but it also makes you take the moment and actually just commit to it, even if it's simply walking to the market. So how many of y'all, and ask you to take a quick poll here, how many of you all actually 
engage with the outside world? How many of you, yes, I enjoy green spaces, whether it's parks, gardens, camping, or how many of you just kind of stay in the urban environment that you're in for whatever, whatever your reason or whatever your justification is. Um, but it is something that I think we become very habitualized in doing. It's like the grocery store that I'm talking about, you know, we we're constantly in a state in a society that wants us to be as productive as possible. So taking the extra 30 minutes to walk somewhere doesn't really seem like a smart idea when we have so much more to do. But in reality, you're actually taking that time to be outside, to engage in your communities, to see things from a different point of view and to maybe breathe a little bit more. So what does this actually look like in action? So how do you actually make this happen? How do you say, yes, this is great. You have all these wonderful photos of playing outside and running around, but for everyone that's not necessarily practical. So how do you make it happen? What does it actually look like? So for those of you that engaged in that poll, for the time, even if you do interact with your green spaces, for the times that you say no, or I cannot, or it just doesn't happen, the next poll is going to be, what are your biggest roadblocks? What are your biggest, your biggest timeouts on why you don't want to do something or why you can't do something or why it's just not feasible at that time? So that'll be another poll that pops up and gives you a couple options on there because we all have whether time or place momentary or long term we all have reasons on why we don't we don't partake in something um so there are some things that you do got to get over there are some hurdles this isn't something that's just going to walk up to your front door and transport you and take your stress away you got to get over that immediate satisfaction and you got to put some work in so for the next slide, we're going to talk about a few hurdles, how you can navigate a night behind a chaotic bar, and then how can you handle this in the next day. So basic needs that you're going to have to figure out is reservations, restrictions, weather, map, right? The list seems daunting, but once you start doing these things, you're going to figure it out pretty quick. You know, whether it's you walk to a park and you realize you forgot something that you sat on, to sit on. Whether you walk to the bodega and you realize you should have brought a bigger bag. Just by engaging and interacting with these small ideas will help you prepare for larger adventures. So these are some things that are to keep in mind, how to be prepared, how to get where you're going and what you're actually going to need. So taking a look at this and finding resources in your area, these are things that we can help you with if you want to reach out, but these are things just to keep in mind at the moment. And these are some things that we kind of consider roadblocks or why a lot of people don't go somewhere. Uh, for me, for a long time, I either didn't have a vehicle or the vehicle I had wasn't sufficient for, let's say, a snowy mountain trip. And I kind of felt stuck. What I have learned in this process is all of the ways to rent a car with not all of the resources you need. So you don't have a credit card there are there are car rental companies Hertz comes to my mind where you actually don't need a credit card to rent a car you need two forms of ID and you have to do it 24 hours in advance well okay you need a credit card but you don't have one how do you get a credit card your credit sucks you don't have money in the account you don't have a line of credit there are actually credit cards out there that you can put money down as a deposit and say you put down $500 on the card, you have 500 lines of credit, you can go back to that rental car company, you can show them the credit card and make it renting it easier. So there are all these tips and tricks that we are happy to share with you if you feel like reaching out to me or feel like reaching out to anyone at Portland Cocktail Week, they can get you in touch with me on how to make things actually possible where a lot of people just say no and walk away there's usually some sort of loophole or some secondary option to make it possible. Um, also, I know that safety was what some of your answers said. There is an element of uncomfortability to it and there is also safety issues. Um, having people there that support you that are interested in the same things, having someone walk to the park with you, have someone go on a jog with you, have someone that can take a drive and 
you know, get you out there and back even just to scope it out and see if you are comfortable with it. Um, using you, the people around you is a great support system. And, you know, at the end of the day, we want you to engage in things that you're safe and comfortable with and some things just aren't it. So always be prepared for that. Um, and there are some steward stewardships on how, how to leave the outdoors better than you found it. And it's leave no trace. And a lot of it are these red blocks, but um, the most important parts of actually getting yourself outside are planning and prepping, uh, staying on the trail if you're in an area that has so a lot of the trails are there for footing for to make sure that you you know don't fall on a crevasse or a tree well it's also to help the environment so you're not eroding away all of the roots that stabilize the trails in the past for other to use um pack it in pack it out is another one so when you go outside you should always have something that is a trash receptacle because people are dirty little monkeys and they leave cigarette butts and cans and everything else around. And if you're going to go outside and play, you should take the responsibility and help, help people leave it better than you found it. And hopefully they'll do the same. Um, here in California, one of our, our biggest natural disasters is wildfires. If you watch your news right now, it is full summer chaos in a lot of areas. So being mindful of what your biggest natural disasters are for us it being fire making sure that you know you're not smoking cigarettes you're not having embers you don't have any thing that will throw a spark on your vehicle or things that can you know really affect millions of people uh respecting wildlife i know there's lots of cute cuddly things out there but our human food is not what is good for their digestive tracts so even if it's a cute ground squirrel or chipmunk please do not feed them um, and just to be considerate of others. There's a lot of people out there. Not everyone's comfortable. Not everyone is as resourceful or as experienced. You know, make way for people on path. Be mindful. Keep in track. Keep in mind that some people just like you are new to this. Um, so those are just some kind of key points. But if you go to backcountryattitude.com, you can find lots of tips and tricks that might help you be a little bit more comfortable or think about different realms on how to be prepared. Um, so I kind of threw a lot of information at you guys. I know that this is a quick class. Again, I'm just going to reiterate that if I am here for resources, I am here to help. I am here if you want to talk about planning a trip and need some insight on that. But I also really want to take the time to give appreciation and gratitude to the platform that we're on with Campari Communities. And I know that Daniel touched on this at the beginning, but do you want to talk any more about the connectedness of, of the brand and the national park and how that has influenced maybe either its flavor profile or the culture around it? Yeah, sure. Um, so actually I'll, I'll show you the bottle of Borrelio. this would actually help so Borrelio is a really interesting label especially because you know it looks exactly like the area around it so <clears throat> that shot of the Stelvio national park is actually on the label of Borrelio. um mount Borrelio is right on here as well um it's one of those things that when you look at it you can really tell what is going to be inside of it or what influences it anyway and that was actually a really good point that you had um you know some of the stories about Borrelio were really interesting a lot of them have to do with um how a lot of these uh, botanicals and, and different things, different ingredients are gathered. So um, there's actually, and has been for uh, since 1875, there have been foragers that go out in Bormio to grab some, uh, you know, some of the local botanicals that are required. Um, obviously there's a lot of wormwood in that area. There's a lot of juniper, um, there's a lot of juniper berries and shrubs um, in the area. So the connection to the place really came from Francesco Poloni as a pharmacist um, as, as you can imagine, in 1875, a pharmacist was really just a collector of different botanicals that people were using as medicine. Um, we didn't have the advanced medicine that we have now. Um, and even some of the things that they used back then, we still use now, which is a very interesting connection. And I think your point on um, how we often distance ourselves from nature um, 
and in a way that it almost blindly we we just go along with things that are suggested to us currently but don't even know the real connection to it um, my favorite example of this is listerine people don't even understand like if you turn over a bottle of listerine there's actually an ingredient called thymol t-h-y um, so it's actually derived from time time at one point was a, a pretty powerful antiseptic um, that it, if used properly um, especially as we use it in Listerine, is something that is is beneficial for, um, for just as a disinfectant. So, um, the connection to nature with Braulio is is really really innate in that everything that goes into it at one point in time came from that area, and the recipe hasn't changed. The way that it's made hasn't changed. Um, the place itself is beautiful. in the, In the summertime, there's tons of hiking that happens there. In the winter, there's a ton of skiing and. Um, and snowboarding and things of that like. So it's one of those places um, I was fortunate enough to go a couple of years ago uh, with a group of bartenders from all over the world. And we spent a day hiking and foraging. Um, we had a, one of the foragers who actually her great grandmother was one of the first foragers for, for uh, Braulio when it, when it came out. Uh, and she took us around the area, she took us to the park and that connection to nature and especially that connection to that place um, as you can see it on the bottle, really translates, especially when you when you taste um, the product. You know, we had a, a wonderful lunch afterward um, in the town of Borneo. There's a couple of really nice little restaurants and um, really homey vibes. And so we sat down and we all, you know, we had a, a really nice lunch. We had a bunch of Braulio. And it was one of those moments where when you smell the product, when you're in the place, it was just so refreshing. And even as I'm talking about the product and as I'm talking about that experience, um, it really does bring back this feeling of comfort and um, and kind of refreshes your soul a little bit. So I, I don't think it's a very foreign concept for a lot of people. Um, I, I know that, you know, uh, I think it was about 70% of the people on that first poll said that um, they enjoy outdoor spaces or they enjoy that sort of thing. And I think it's really important. I think this time, especially during quarantine has been difficult for a lot of people, you know, myself included, um, I also live in California. I live in Los Angeles, and a part of my routine about three or four days a week is to go on a hike, um, usually for about an hour, hour and a half. And just that time, uh, usually early in the morning before it gets too hot, it's just one of those things that I really appreciate about living here because uh, even though I do live in a major metropolitan city, it's not that hard to get away for about an hour to get into nature and to, to spend that time kind of relaxing. Um, it also allows you the time to to just sort through all the things that you need to do. Your brain is is always constantly running. And as Karina mentioned, especially working behind the bar, working in hospitality, you're so focused all of the time um, while you're doing that. And you need to take that time to, to unwind and to process everything. So um, I love this seminar and I love all the information you put together, Karina. Thank you so much for doing that. Um, also, thanks um, Portland Cocktail Week for, for giving this platform. I really appreciate um, all of these things that you guys have have put out for everybody and all the opportunities that you've given everyone. Uh, I think it's been really beneficial. It's been beneficial for me being a part of it and being allowed to um, spend this time speaking with everybody. So thank you for that. Um, and Karina, I'll let you I'll let you wrap it up if you have anything else um, that you want to you want to touch on. No, I think that's it. I mean, I thank you again for the platform and allowing me to speak. Um, I think that it is just a tool and a resource that we can definitely use right now more than ever with people having more time as well as having new stresses and kind of a, a break to kind of take inventory and restock. I appreciate you sharing your stories and I know that it's something that has made me feel like I was 80 to actually feeling like I'm in my <laughs> late 20s, maybe not in reality, but I at least feel a lot better. Um, mentally, emotionally, and even physically, a lot of my aches and pains and things that I thought were going to end my bar career have actually relieved themselves just with interacting and being more active in the outdoors. Cool, awesome. Yeah. Well, thanks for taking the time today. Thanks for um, thanks Portland Cocktail Week. Appreciate you guys. Um, love you guys very much. Thank you for giving everybody this platform and this time. Um, and stay tuned. Tune into Compart Community. We're going to have more of these. Um, we're going to have more interactions with bartenders and, and people from all over the country, all over the world. So very excited.